Hey Wheaton North, Mr. Earl here. This video will introduce us to acids and bases. This is kind of an extension of equilibrium, uh, but now a new context where we're talking about acids and bases. A lot of this stuff, pretty much everything in this in this video should be review. So there's a lot of different uh, concepts that we're going to go over, but you've seen all of these before, and so uh, a lot of it should be review for you. Let's start with calculating pH and H plus concentration. Water self-ionizes, so even if you have completely pure water, there's still a fraction of the water molecules that are at an equilibrium with H3O plus, this is called the hydronium ion, and OH minus, the hydroxide ion. One thing to keep in mind is that H3O plus, the hydronium ion, is kind of often written as just H plus. They're interchangeable. It's whether or not you keep the water, you're showing the water in there or not. Okay, And it just so happens that the uh, the concentration of these two ions in pure water, when you multiply them, you get exactly 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. And this is where our pH comes from. Um, so in basic solutions, you have more hydroxide than, than hydronium ion, than H+. And in acidic solutions, you have more H+, and less hydroxide, right? So in pure water, they're equal amounts, because if you're starting with just pure water, it's going to ionize in a uh, one-to-one ratio, and you're going to have equal amounts of H+, and OH-. Now, you're familiar with pH. You've seen pH before. The P in pH essentially stands for negative log. So take the negative log of the H concentration, and that gives you the pH. So the inverse of that is to take 10 to the negative pH to get the H plus concentration. Here's a series of different uh, everyday substances and their uh, approximate pHs. So this is actually a very narrow range. We can have H plus concentrations outside of this range. So you can technically have negative pHs, uh, but pH is used to, to kind of describe a very specific range of common uh, stuff that we come in contact with every day. You can also do the same thing, the same calculations with the OH concentration, and that's called the pOH. You'll see this less often, uh, but it's, it's done the exact same way. And then the pH and the pOH have to add up to 14, and that 14 is connected to the negative log of this number, which, is, which would be 14. All right, now strength versus concentration. This is a really important concept that you absolutely have to, um, have, have, to have down. How concentrated or how dilute a, a solution is uh, refers to how much of it you have, kind of the density or the uh, molarity of the solution. Strong versus weak in the context of acids and bases doesn't refer to how much of it you have. It refers to how much of it ionizes as an acid or a base. So if we think of a generic uh, acid, acids typically start with H. So this is going to ionize to H plus and A minus. The extent to which this ionizes is the strength of the acid. So uh, strong acids ionize completely, so we often show them with, a, with just a one directional arrow. They're 100% ions, right? There's, um, there's virtually no HA left in solution. With weak acids or weak bases, they ionize somewhat, so, and that's dependent on um, an equilibrium expression. So we show this with, a, with an equilibrium arrow, double arrow, so you have both HA and the ions in solution. Most acids are actually weak acids. So think about it. Is it possible to have a concentrated weak acid? Here's a, a particle picture of several different types of concentrations and strengths. Identify which ones are concentrated and which ones are strong. The strong ones are the ones that ionize completely. Notice that in both of these, you have zero HA left. It's all ionized. The weak ones are obviously the other ones, the ones that have some HA. Now we have two different types of each of these, right? This would, this, these two are both strong. Uh, this one would be more concentrated, and this one would be more dilute, but they're both strong. There's a series of strong acids and bases that you just kind of have to know. They're going to have really large uh, dissociation K values. The strong acids are uh, hydrohalic acids, so that's hydrochloric acid, hydrobromic acid, hydroiodic acid. Uh, sulfuric acid, perchloric acid, and nitric acid. These six acids are the only strong acids. Every other acid in the world, uh, for our purposes at least, is going to be not strong. We can also have strong bases, and the same thing, it's the same concept, they, they dissociate completely. And that's going to be the hydroxides of the group 1 or group 2 metals. There's a couple exceptions, uh, but pretty much all of them are strong bases. Now some of them are insoluble, like calcium hydroxide is, is largely insoluble. And so obviously it's not going to be a very strong base if it's largely solid and it's not even dissolved. You may remember conjugate acid-base pairs. Let's start by defining what exactly is an acid. 
we kind of dove into this without really um, stopping to talk about what what makes something an acid. Typically, acids are going to start with an H, but not always. Uh, this is called the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid. They're proton donors, so they're giving up protons in solution. So when you look at this first example here, which reactant is giving off its proton uh, to form the products? It's the water. So you don't think of water as an acid, but in this case it is because it's giving off its proton. The, the NH3 is accepting it, and so that makes it a base. Now there's also what's called the conjugate acids and the conjugate bases. The acid becomes the conjugate base. So if you look at this first example, our, our acid is our water. The conjugate base would then be OH because going backwards, it would have to gain a proton, right? So it gives off the proton, making it an acid in the forward reaction, but it gains the proton in the reverse reaction, making it a base. But it's a conjugate base because it's the reverse reaction. So the acid always becomes the conjugate base, and the base always becomes the conjugate acid. Which one is the conjugate acid and which one's the conjugate base in this next example? The base here is the CO3 that's already labeled and it's accepting the proton going, going to the product side. So then to go to the reactant side, it would have to lose the proton, right? And so it would become the conjugate acid. What about this last one? Same idea, the phosphate ion is gaining the proton and then to go back, it would have to give it up, which would make it the conjugate acid. The stronger the acid, the weaker the conjugate base, and the, and the inverse is also true. So if NH3 is a weak acid, which it is because it's not a hydroxide, then that means its conjugate acid is relatively strong, meaning it gives off its proton relatively easily. All right, one last thing, acid dissociation constants. Um, the ionization is reversible, so we're talking about weak acids or weak bases, because strong completely dissociate. So here's our, a generic acid dissociation reaction. Um, and we're going to have a K value, just like an equilibrium, because there's an equilibrium between products and reactants. Drop out the water because it's liquid, and so we still have products over reactants, just as always. Now it's a Ka because we're talking about acids. We can also talk about Kbs for bases. It's the exact same thing. We just put a different uh, label on it because we're talking about a base instead of an acid. So if we have a metal hydroxide, it's going to dissociate into its metal and its hydroxide ion. And so you're going to have products over your reactants. Now the extent to which something ionizes makes the K, affects the K value, right? So a really large K value means that it's a pretty strong acid. It's largely products. It's largely ions. A really small K value, it means that it's largely still undissociated, right? It's still the metal hydroxide or it's still the HA. Very little of it has, has um, dissociated. So the stronger the acid or the base, the more products you're going to have, and that's going to result in a larger Ka. Or you could say Kb if it's a if it's a base. All right, let's look at it one example. Um, the pH of, of your blood is roughly 7.4. Calculate the, the H concentration, the OH concentration, and the POH. Go ahead and pause the video and do that real quick. All right, welcome back. Uh, here's our our equations that we can use. And so there's a couple different, there's lots of different ways you can do this. Let's start with the easy one, uh, calculating pOH. We have the pH, we know that the pH and the pOH have to add up to 14, and so just, just subtract from 14, and you end up with 6.6. .6. All right, now that we have the pOH, we can find the OH concentration. Take 10 to the negative pOH, the negative 6.6, .6, and we have the OH concentration, and that's always in molarity. Um, now, I'm going to do this a different way. You could take the pH and do the same thing to find the H plus concentration, but we can also use this equation here. The product of the two concentrations have to have to multiply to, um, to 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So if we divide 1 times 10 to the negative 14th by uh, our OH concentration, that will give us our H plus concentration. One thing to note, uh, because it's a logarithmic scale, the, the, the significant digits are kind of uh, funky with pHs. So the number of decimal places in your, P, in your pH should match the total number of significant figures in your, in your concentration numbers. So that's a lot of review. You're going to need to have a good handle on this stuff, though, in order to make sense of the stuff that's coming later. And so uh, it might be worthwhile to go back and, and maybe just review certain sections of this video if you need to. All right, this is Mr. Urgler signing out.